Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, and also, actually, good afternoon for those who are joining in from both Kiev and across Europe. Um, I want to welcome everybody to the Transatlantic Task Force. This is our uh, 10th event that we're having, and we really appreciate everyone joining. I want to thank my colleagues uh, that are joining from Brussels, those that are in Kiev uh, for joining, um, and also, <clears throat> obviously, this is an incredibly important time uh, to talk about Ukraine. My name is Jonathan Katz. I'm the, uh, I, I'm the director of the Front Lines of Democracy Initiative, but I also co-chair the Friends of Ukraine Network's Democracy and Civil Society Task Force with Oris, who's on the screen as well, um, and also uh, help co-found uh, the Transatlantic Task Force. So let's, let's, get, to, let's get to business. Um, today's event is uh, on the record, just a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, everybody uh, is our Zoom experts today. You will only see the speakers on the screen. Um, they can't see you. Uh, and also, please use the Q&A function uh, that's located at the bottom of your screen. So everybody is, is familiar with this. First of all, I just want to thank a couple of our, of our partners for today's event, um, the Reanimation Package of Reform, uh, which has been a staunch partner uh, working with us over the last couple of years, uh, but also the German Marshall Fund of the United States, both in Washington and in Brussels. Also, the U.S.-Ukraine Foundation. I mentioned the Friends of the Ukraine Network. They were also um, a, a real part of pulling this together and have been for the last couple of years. Um, one of the things I wanted to do today, obviously, <clears throat> if you look at the, the title of today's event, is a focus on stagnation of reforms. And I think this conversation is focused not only on just anti-corruption reforms, rule of law, but economic reforms as well. And I think many of you, six years after the Maidan, one year into the Zelensky administration, are looking really deeply at what's taking place both in Ukraine, but also how it's impacting Ukraine's trajectory going forward, its democracy, uh, its Euro-Atlantic track, uh, but also how it's able to withstand pressure uh, from the Kremlin. And as we all remember, there's still an ongoing conflict, uh, unfortunately, in the East. So today's conversation, and we have really uh, two outstanding speakers uh, joining us uh, today, and I'm really thankful that you could be here, um, is to talk about where things stand on key reforms. Obviously, we cannot and we can't ignore the COVID-19 situation, which has dramatically impacted Ukraine, its reform efforts, where it stands today, but it's also a global phenomenon, so it's impacting Ukraine's partners, including the United States uh, and the EU. So today we're going to speak to directly, and our speakers will discuss uh, what's taking place. But I can say for myself that there's deep concerns about whether or not their direction is going in the way that we all hoped that it would a year into the Zelensky administration. Concerns about who is overseeing uh, key bodies within Ukraine, including uh, uh, those that have been brought in based on a shuffle in government, taking out key reformers and replacing them with those that may not have the same credentials. Um, even concerns today about whether or not Ukraine will implement its obligations under its new IMF agreement. So there's a lot to discuss. Um, of course, reforms have been passed, uh, but that doesn't mean that the reforms have been implemented. And I think we've seen this uh, story before in Ukraine where there's some steps forward, but also uh, steps back. For many of us concerned about steps back, um, it's because we want to see Ukraine move forward. Uh, we want to see a clear Euro-Atlantic path uh, for Ukraine. And of course, um, that takes leadership. It takes the willingness of the government to move forward on these reforms, having the right people in place and the right partners. So in this, uh, on this point, in this last point, I'm going to turn it to my colleague uh, in Washington, Oris. Oris has been um, a longtime expert on Ukraine, working at the Helsinki Commission, but also uh, in, in numerous leadership positions, working with a number of organizations, Ukrainian American community, um, and I think is probably one of the, the smartest observers of both uh, of what's taking place in Ukraine in terms of reforms, but also in terms of understanding uh, where the United States is, both the executive branch and Congress with respect to, to Ukraine. Oris, if I can send it over to you. Um, just for an opening statement. And then Bruno, I'm going to turn to my uh, colleague Bruno in Brussels um, to, to pick it up from there. Forrest, over to you. Thanks, Jonathan, for that uh, 
excessively generous introduction, perhaps. Uh, I want to just briefly, in the two, three minutes, I have focused in on one issue that's uh, causing a lot of concern and consternation here in the West that I'm sure our distinguished speakers will address too. And that is uh, politically motivated prosecutions and selective justice. Uh, the 20 or so charges leveled against Poroshenko, many of these are frivolous um, and others, they look like political score settling and are starting to be reminiscent of the kind of selective justice we saw in the Yanukovych era. Um, not, not only Poroshenko, but we have cases, investigations, politically motivated ones, I believe, against some of the former reformist uh, officials in the government that was dismissed in the March shakeup. We have cases against civil society activists, Maidan or Sternenko in Odessa, or what seems to be the increasingly shaky case against the alleged killers of a journalist Pavel Sheremet. And meanwhile, the truly bad actors uh, such as Euro Maidan killers or other human rights abusers uh, or corrupt oligarchs or officials from previous governments, notably the Yanukovych governments, they all seem to go free or are protected. Um, and this resulting in what the State Department has properly called a climate of impunity. Um, now, if there is, in some of these cases, sufficient, credible, serious evidence, um, then Ukrainian authorities need to prosecute them in a manner consistent with rule of law, um, in a fair manner, in a just manner, uh, with the presumption of innocence, using due process. Politically motivated prosecutions uh, and selective justice do not serve Ukraine's interest, I believe. They divide society, they harm democracy, and they hurt Ukraine's national security, and this plays into Moscow's hands. Um, and it doesn't engender confidence, as we know, in Ukraine's partners, certainly not in the United States government, in the United States Congress, which have been staunch supporters of Ukraine for decades. Um, nor from other international partners or the international business community, or for that matter, the Ukrainian diaspora, which just in the last week or two have been issuing numerous statements, whether it be the Ukrainian American diaspora, Canadian, or even the Australian diaspora. So just a lot of growing concern. And this is a path I hope Ukraine's authorities um, really rethink what they are doing in this respect and, and instead concentrate on real reforms and real change, the kinds of things that Hannah and Alexandra, I'm sure, will be talking about uh, very soon. So with that, turn it over to you and I look forward to hearing from our distinguished speakers. Boris, Boris thank you so much. <clears throat> thank you for that assessment too and the concerns um, that I've also heard too about political prosecutions and also uh, sort of, you know, off the track too. And, and if you're looking at polling numbers within Ukraine, you can actually see those numbers uh, for the government having come uh, down quickly. So um, it's really important. Can I turn now, I'm going to just turn over to, to Bruno in Brussels to pick up. And Bruno, thank you again. You've been a, a great partner uh, with the task force and um, it's great to, to see you and, and picking up from where you see and also um, how, how is the view from Brussels, from the EU, uh, and obviously the EU is playing a big role addressing issues such as COVID-19, but also as a, as a key partner uh, of Ukraine, and we see this through some of the work on, on the Eastern Partnership efforts that over the last couple of weeks that the EU is accelerating that effort. So Bruno, over to you. And, and thank you to you, Jonathan, for always including me in these highly interesting conversations. As you mentioned, GMF has a long history of working on Ukraine-related issues. Uh, and also today, here at GMF Brussels, or in tandem with you, Jonathan, in Washington, or other GMF offices, uh, Ukraine remains a big priority for us. Uh, and let me also here, you know, myself thank the US-Ukraine Foundation, RPR partners, for always be of such a great support. Uh, now, uh, being in Brussels, uh, I can give you the view here, you asked for it. Uh, I can say that uh, Ukraine definitely remains a high priority on the European agenda, uh, despite so much domestic attention being hijacked by the corona crisis. 
but I do think that Ukraine will continue to be for the to be a priority for the EU. Uh, the Union has engaged itself so much in the past years. I think it's simply difficult to walk away like that from Kiev. Uh, just for you, just to mention, since 2014, the EU and European financial institutions have mobilized support for almost 15 billion euro in grants and loans to support Ukraine in the reform. So that is indeed quite substantial uh, and also makes Europe uh, Ukraine's largest international partner uh, for that. So we're talking money here. We're talking a lot of money uh, that is involved and uh, the reforms in Ukraine are therefore being closely watched in Brussels. Uh, and I would say there is optimism for sure, uh, but there's also some concerns. Uh, optimism because just last May, the EU approved another 500 million euro loan, part of a fourth microfinancial assistance program. Now, that was an important signal that the EU believed that Ukraine has completed necessary benchmark reforms in several domains, including healthcare, energy, uh, social policies, just to mention a few. And the side of the EU, I, I also briefly want to mention the achievements made to modernize Ukrainian armed forces, uh, which was an important prerequisite for Ukraine to be recently promoted as an enhanced partner of NATO, which is also important, of course. Now, th th that's the good news. Uh, but yes, there's also some concern in Brussels. Uh, there's a lot of talk about several outstanding reforms that still need to be reinforced so that Ukraine, but primarily also Ukrainian people can fully benefit from the EU-Ukraine Association Agreements or the deep and comprehensive free trade area. The EU is definitely keeping an eye on anti-corruption efforts. There are signals that in some areas we may actually be sliding back, especially as it was already mentioned in the justice sectors and the rule of law. But another point that is often being mentioned here is, is that Ukraine could still do better when it comes to improving the business and investment climate. Uh, as long as domestic and international investors are not feeling confident to enter the Ukrainian market, it will be very hard to boost the creation of jobs in, in Ukraine. Now, this EU feedback is, is especially important, I think, because uh, Ukraine uh, is still facing big budgetary balance gaps and will likely need additional financial aid in the future as well. So it, it's really important to, to keep into account the feedback of a partner like the EU, but also others, including the IMF or the, or the World Bank. So I think this summarizes in short the conversations here in Brussels uh, when it comes to reforms. Of course, beyond reforms, the EU is also in full support of Ukraine's independence, territorial integrity through the Minsk process. It's, it's perhaps worth mentioning that just yesterday, the EU agreed to extend uh, Crimea and Donbass related sanctions uh, against Russia for another six mm -hmm. months. So that's positive news. Uh, I'll leave it there for now as a mean of introduction and definitely looking forward to further discuss uh, during the q So many thanks, Bruno. Bruno, thank you. And I'm glad you mentioned both the, the sanctions uh, issue, uh, but also the security uh, side of what's taking place and support uh, in Brussels, as well as the macroeconomic support. And I'm, I'm really looking forward to hearing more from our, our speakers as well about the economic environment. Um, reforms are directly, key reforms are directly related to, uh, uh, you know, to what you talked about in terms of investors. Um, I know, Alexandra, too, that there's, um, I think it, there was even a statement um, today from, um, from I think maybe, other, maybe yourself and others regarding the, uh, the economic environment or reforms um, and direct investment. Uh, Ukraine also faces a, a significant challenge from COVID-19, uh, I think, including uh, what, what is in essence a recession um, and as well as some of its partners uh, in the region. So there's a lot to do there, a lot to focus on. Um, important to see that, that both the EU the IMF, the World Bank just announced uh, its additional macroeconomic assistance. So there's certainly confidence that Ukraine can do uh, the right thing. We're seeing these big macroeconomic packages uh, moving forward with the support of the United States, with the support of the EU uh, and Western partners for Ukraine. But, but, but something underlying all this, 
uh, seems to be a lack of confidence in, in, in the government, in both internally in Ukraine, but also externally in partners about carrying out these key reforms and what this roadmap looks like going ahead. So I think that's a perfect segue uh, to Dennis in, uh, in Kiev to pick up uh, from where I'm leaving off, Dennis, with RPR. Uh, thank you, and, uh, and thank you for all your work pulling all this together today. Dennis, over to you. Thank you, Jonathan. Thank you, Boris, and thank you, Bruno, for such a great introduction. Um, our first speaker uh, for today is uh, Hannah Hopko, who is a former, a former member of Parliament of the Eighth uh, Parliament Convocation. This is a previous convocation. Um, Ms. Hopko, you have up to seven minutes to speak. I can ask you not to exceed these time limits, uh, therefore we can secure more time for Q&A session. And uh, I also kind of ask you to reflect the uh, role of the block of the rule of law issues mentioned by the Jonathan Bruna and Horace. Uh, Ms. Hopko, the floor is yours. Unmuted. Unmuted. Yeah. Uh, thank you, uh, everybody, for organizing today discussion. I think it's really very important. Thanks, Jonathan, Bruno, uh, Oris, for your, uh, I think, very important uh, speech. So I agree fully with you that instead of concentrating on real reforms, focusing on key priorities for Ukraine, um, Zelensky and uh, General Prosecutor Office, they are uh, fully engaged in uh, politically motivation, uh, motivated uh, persecution cases uh, against activists of Maidan via uh, State Bureau of Investigation, uh, also against uh, the fifth president uh, of Ukraine, Poroshenko, and uh, many others um, activists. And uh, within more than one year of Zelensky presidency, the society hasn't received an answer on key uh, questions in the uh, Handuk uh, uh, case, uh, no results on investigation. The same, uh, we are seeing a lot of attacks on Sternenko uh, and uh, many others. And just recently we conducted a zero corruption uh, talk on police reform, is mission possible? And it's um, true that Ukraine police is still a sunk in violence, torture, and corruption. There is a still desperate need to build the police that really protect people and have their trust. So I think it's uh, also uh, important uh, to keep focusing on judiciary reform because uh, six years after the Revolution of Dignity, judiciary remains one of the most corrupt and at least trusted public institution in Ukraine. And uh, without uh, rule of law, it's hard to bring investment to Ukraine and also to create uh, working places and to solve social problems. And with COVID-19, uh, besides uh, external threats, we are also uh, receiving a lot of internal problems. And without a strong economy, it will be very hard uh, to uh, proper respond on the pandemic, uh, I mean, the uh, Ministry of Health issues, but we still have a lot of problems with the efficiency of procurement of COVID-19 related medication in Ukraine, and um, also a lot of corruption, but uh, let me use this opportunity to express uh, our gratitude for strong support on behalf of the EU and the United States helping Ukraine uh, to cope with uh, COVID-19, uh, uh, all these uh, problems. And um, I mentioned uh, judiciary reform, why it's really important, because recently President Zelensky submitted the draft law regarding judiciary reform to the parliament, but it does not provide grounds for establishing an independence body for scrutiny of members of the higher council of uh, justice or conducting pre-selection to this body. So, and uh, you know that uh, according to the IMF obligations, it's one of the uh, criteria. And uh, I think that this will be my advice to President Zelensky team that he has to prioritize judiciary reform 
and refrain from attacks on independent anti-corruption institutions, specifically National Anti-Corruption Bureau, and also uh, refrain from attacks on National uh, uh, Bank of Ukraine. I think that um, success story with establishment of high anti-corruption court shows that Ukraine does have professional independent judges with higher integrity, which enjoy trust from the civil society. And it's important to create a proper selection procedure to ensure such kind of individuals have chances to be selected. And foreign experts from judges and prosecutors had crucial role in banning bad candidates uh, to higher anti-corruption uh, uh, court, uh, had power to interview those candidates with questionable integrity, and there was no way to influence the decision of these experts. Similar approach has to be taken for reboot of judicial self-governance bodies, which are hiring and uh, firing judges, specifically higher council of justice. And if you look like helicopter view on all reform agenda, and it's really pity that after dignity revolution, when we uh, established, we found, uh, founded the reanimation package of reforms, we achieved a lot in anti-corruption reform, judiciary reform, uh, decentralization, healthcare, education reform, reform in Ukrainian uh, army and procurement in defense and security. And now we are living in the time when a lot of reforms uh, stuck or we are seeing a revenge of bad practices or kleptocratic or with bad reputation people uh, nominated and being appointed, uh, for example, like act uh, just uh, this, uh, these days, acting minister of uh, education, Mr. Scarlett, and uh, who used to work uh, with the uh, Yanukovych team. And today we've seen a lot of protests in Kyiv against this appointment. And because there were no um, uh, 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 consultations with Ukrainian parliament. So it seems besides um, uh, education reform, there are also healthcare reform. A lot of uh, step backs in this direction, especially in the second phase of healthcare reform, which is really uh, one of the key reform, especially in the times of pandemic. Also decentralization reform, uh, it, which is really important because this autumn uh, there will be local elections in Ukraine. And uh, today everybody is discussing the drop of Zelensky and his political party uh, in popularity, which is very dramatically, and all these uh, uh, pro-Russian voters, which uh, used to support Zelensky, now they go back to a pro-Russian opposition bloc. And I think this is a part of Russian hybrid warfare. Uh, and we will have the situation when we could say that we have free and fair elections, but the result of these elections will be very risky for our um, uh, statehood, for our territorial integrity, and especially during the local elections in east and south of Ukraine, where we are seeing the growing popularity of oppositional bloc, uh, which could create a lot of problems with growing separatism one day. So I think uh, coming back to um, Zelensky, uh, more than one year of presidency, we could summarize that, unfortunately, his unpreparedness, his incompetency, also lack of professional people, also uh, readiness to uh, play as an actor, not as uh, a president, uh, making a lot of uh, videos instead of working hard with the parliament and with allies in the parliament, even if they're in the opposition, like political party Holos, or European solidarity. It's also, you have to be wise when you are thinking about your country, not just about your popularity, especially in Ukraine, when we are facing for almost seven years uh, ongoing uh, Russian uh, uh, military aggression and now pand pandemic plus oligarchs, Akhmetov, Kolomoisky, uh, Pinchuk and others, so they are trying to uh, return their influence in key energy uh, sector 
And, uh, you know, uh, now uh, Kolomoisky and Medvedchuk, which I think it's really important one day to impose sanctions on those Ukrainian or pro-Russian oligarchs which are uh, undermining uh, a reform process in Ukraine using their TV channels uh, as an instrument, as a weapon against uh, uh, transformation of uh, Ukraine and demanding from president uh, some concessions in uh, their interest. So um, I think it's also very important now to protect National Bank of Ukraine and uh, state private bank. They have very good management and uh, uh, we understand that Kolomoisky and um, uh, will try to use unreformed uh, Ukrainian uh, courts uh, to protect his interest. So I think um, also since uh, our discussion is going just in the eve of uh, important uh, amendments to the Russian constitution. And also you, you might seen this decree by Mr. Putin calling uh, uh, to different uh, soldiers from reserve to participate in their military assemblies in 2020. So there are different predictions of, of potential escalation of uh, military aggression by Mr. Putin and even our Deputy Minister of Foreign Affairs, Mr. Vasil Bodnar, uh, made a clear statement that Ukrainians should be ready for new uh, acts of uh, aggression from the Russian side. So I think here, when Bruno mentioned, and, as, and, and we are very thankful for EU um, extension of uh, sanctions against uh, Russian Federation, which is really- Before I please conclude your statement. Yeah. So because unfortunately there is no, uh, there is just imitation or, or uh, ignorance of means implementation by Putin. There is no ceasefire. So these sanctions are really very important. And also I'm, con I'm finishing with Nord Stream 2. Uh, thanks Americans for their sanctions, but we really, we consider your sanctions as in new javelins to stop Nord Stream 2 and also to help Ukraine to be more energy independent and together with Moldova to move uh, heaven in SOE to our uh, Eurocontinental Euro um, uh, energy grid. And Belarus, I think it's really important having uh, today Americans and Europeans, Brussels on our discussions, to see this transatlantic uh, solidarity and unity helping Ukraine to become successful because the importance, geopolitical importance of success in Ukraine, it's important for transformation of Russia, Belarus, Moldova, and Georgia. So um, after, but I'm still belonging to the optimists, even seeing revenge of Russian forces, but we will have more work to stop them and to focus on building strong institutions, having strong civil society. Thank you. Thank you for such a great speech. And I'm quite sure that we'll continue during the Q&A session. And I'm quite sure there will be a lot of questions from our audience. Um, and let me introduce our second speaker for today is uh, Alexandra Buckley, uh, who is a famous economic expert and former chief economist of the Ministry of Finance of Ukraine in 2018. Um, Mr. Lee, uh, thank you for joining us. And the floor is yours for up to seven minutes. After a rather pessimistic speech, I would like to start basically from the optimistic slogan, which is that basically we really dream about prosperity Ukraine with happy people, with good chances and opportunities for personal and business development in Ukraine. And I really would like to hope that this is still possible in Ukraine, even in current situation when we have some revenge as Hannah has told. And basically what we had is what we have is that uh, key to this success is macroeconomic stability and economic growth. And over the last five years basically Ukraine made a good uh, progress in reaching macro stability with the good structural reforms, with a moderate reaching moderate pace of growth, with reduced debt to GDP rate, so inflation on the lower bound of uh, inflation target. Uh, 
As in most countries of the world, outbreak of COVID-19 pandemic has wasn't the outlook, but again, I mean, like, hopefully it will be a third term uh, worsening of situation and then we will return to economic growth. And uh, what we see at the moment is that uh, real GDP declined by 1.3% uh, in the first quarter, which is not much. In the second quarter, um, it is estimated to decline by about 8-10% uh, year-on-year terms. And in May, we have already seen the indicators of the improvement of situation in real trade, uh, in industries, uh, that basically show us that the situation becomes better. The major question currently is whether we basically uh, already passed the peak of the crisis, and here I would like to again repeat the word, which is, uh, I think, the most common word in IMF speeches at the moment is uncertainty. This is uncertainty about pandemic. Therefore, nobody really knows whether we will have a second wave of uh, COVID-19 and whether it will turn out to be another lockdown in all countries. However, in Ukraine, we have another type of uncertainty as well. And this is domestic uncertainty about directions of economic policies, uh, which is really substantial. Because Hannah talked more about not economic ones, like anti-corruption measures, etc. But we have also kind of big uncertainty in the economic policies. Um, and this was stated by the IMF. And I think that this is kind of the crucial situation at the moment. And this is where the government has to finally clear up the things how it should and how it would proceed to return to economic growth fast. And basically to accelerate the economic growth, Ukraine really requires substantial investment. Without investments, we will not be able to accelerate economic growth. And according to recent, I mean like, already not that recent study of the World Bank, uh, even uh, before the COVID-19, we could reach Poland in 50 years if we proceed uh, with the same pace of reforms, et cetera. Therefore, reforms are crucial. And for this, Ukraine really has to become a reliable partner. It has to be a reliable partner uh, to follow the liabilities taken into in the cooperation with the European Union, with the IMF, World Bank, as well as keep up with promises it provided basically to business when uh, reforms were conducted in the preceding five years. And for example, prudent fiscal and monetary policies should be continued. And key here is a strong, strong institutions that Ukraine currently doesn't have always. We still have weak institutions and it's not only a weak uh, rule of law, but also in other spheres like anti-monopoly committee, et cetera, they need strengthening. However, we have a good example of really good and strong independent institution, and this is National Bank of Ukraine. And we, actually what we see from the uh, NBU perspective is that prominent policies of NBU in previous years, um, they allowed us to enter this crisis and, uh, with a strong financial sector, basically banking sector, we didn't have problem there. We didn't have huge uh, Grimna depreciation. We, we're good at this point, even though in previous crises we usually had banking problem, we had problems with the green depreciation, etc. And uh, and you what was really good in prompt and quick answer to mitigation plan during the crisis during the COVID-19. And this includes refinancing of banks, which basically creates opportunities for banks to support businesses in Ukraine. It also uh, allowed the good policies beforehand and the lowered inflation, allowed them in the EU basically reduce the key rate, which also allows banks to reduce um, credit rates and therefore opens opportunities for business to take credits and basically build the business. And uh, uh, basically here, I would again, I mean, like say that there are some politicians at the moment and some experts as well who say that NBU should print money to go for quantity easing that I'm strongly against though because there is no need for this now. Financing measures are fine. And besides, uh, NBU cannot print dollars and uh, euros. Therefore, we cannot really use this practice that other countries are doing because we are printing Grimna and uh, the previous experience shows that usually if such printing is done, it goes to 
foreign exchange market, it goes to inflation. So, I mean, like, we will basically not support macroeconomic stability, but do the harm to that. And therefore, taking this into account, yeah, the uh, recent creation of Parliament Investigation Committee or whatever on the NBU uh, activities is uh, seen by most experts as very unfavorable attempt and as basically step towards kind of uh, threatening the independence of the national bank. And I think that's why basically IMF pushes so hard for the independence of national bank. But it's not only about IMF. Basically, all Ukrainians need strong NBU to have stable financial system, stable uh, banking system, and that's what we need. Also, uh, to, uh, when we talk about reforms, when we do uh, see letter of intent, which is uh, part of the basically program, IMF program, this is uh, liability that the government has taken for the reforms. And the key thing here is that it all talks about continuation of reforms. We don't really promise to do new reforms. We have promised to continue what we have started to do and what have allowed Ukraine to grow, to reach stability and economic growth. So we talk about continuation of tax and custom reform, uh, the implementation of healthcare reform that Hannah was talking about. The government has pro uh, promised to refrain from introducing new tax privileges, exemptions, etc. However, what we see at the moment that NPS have already submitted a draft laws on the uh, introduction of industrial parks that envisage these tax privileges. However, the analysis and the um, surveys of investors show that um, investors do not need these tax privileges. What they need is good infrastructure, stable rules of the game, and uh, when we talk about uh, um, infrastructure, we talk about access to infrastructure as well. For example, this is easy and cheap access to power grids, which is a problem still in Ukraine. And uh, investors, as Ghana told already, requires real rule of law. Without rule of law, any privileges will not help. And uh, also, uh, we have a promise to keep at the place, for example, our excellent, I think, uh, e-procurement system, Prozora, which uh, complies with the European Union directive, which was, uh, rec has received awards from international partners. And, uh, but again, currently what we see is kind of stagnation of the reform taken uh, as MPs have already, uh, again, submitted the draft law, which changed the rule of Prozora system. Which is not the and uh, we also uh, have promised to continue corporate governance reforms, but again, we see some step backs uh, from this reform. And uh, what is more important here is that we really have to continue these reforms. But what is really necessary here is the ownership of reforms. This really matters, and reforms are successful in Ukraine if there is an ownership from the government. The civil society uh, could push, advocate, but we cannot really implement reforms. Therefore, we really need the government to understand that these reforms are the path forward to pr prosperous Ukraine, and we have to continue these reforms, not because IMF has told us to do this, or the European Union or other partners, but because we need this country to exist, we need it to be prosperous, and uh, we need people to be happy, basically, in this country. And this is the way forward to reduce migration, not just to close the borders, as uh, some people discuss. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. And again, I, I think we'll have a lot of questions related to the economic issues, because uh, every state has experienced some kind of economic stagnation um, in classical uh, economic uh, definition of, of stagnation and uh, uh, th at this point uh, I see that we have at least uh, two questions already uh, in our question box and I would pass to Jonathan back to you. Great Dennis thank you and thank you for those those uh, those opening statements and I think they both raise a lot of, uh, I know a lot of questions. I would ask uh, anybody who wants to ask a question right now to, to use the, the Q&A function. Uh, but I wanted to just maybe just quickly pick up 
uh, and sort of moderator prerogative to ask a quick question, starting uh, with Alexandra too. You're, and I think this goes to Hanna too, who is in parliament sort of working to pass, but also make certain that, th that, that laws are implemented. I think the crux of, of reforms that, you talk, that you're talking about that are needed, um, you mentioned you know, um, that Ukraine has to, this has to be a priority for Ukraine. Uh, Western partners are important. Um, IMF, although I think the IMF is quite limited alone in how it can move a government. They're just, they don't have the capacity to do it. This is my perspective. Um, and that you really need partners, but you really need Ukrainian leadership to do it. And I guess the question, sort of Hannah touched on this too, we're seeing um, a slowdown or stagnation. And uh, Alexandra, are you confident? And I, somebody emailed me um, when we sent out the invitation for this event, they were concerned that, that the Zelensky government would not, um, would not adhere to IMF conditionality, that it was very likely that you have one tranche of funding that has already come in, 1.5 million, you had the EU funding, the World Bank funding, and perhaps on the macroeconomic side, that was more than enough uh, to help create some uh, stability that when we see Ukraine not needing the macro support, and even before COVID-19, there was concerns that reforms would not be carried out. Are you confident that the government will um, keep to its agreement uh, with the IMF? And how concerned should Western partners be, let alone also Ukrainians be, that, that somehow these deals won't be fulfilled? Because we're already seeing slippage shortly after this agreement was, was reached, but yet we're still seeing the World Bank and others move forward on macroeconomic reform, so a macroeconomic support. So Alexandra, maybe I could just, it, it's a question to you, but it was also something that somebody emailed me that really struck me, that we may see a, a backsliding on, on agreements, and that would be both for Ukrainians, but also for investors, uh, for Western partners, this takes Ukraine in a really, in the wrong track uh, for a number of reasons. Alexandra, over to you. And Hannah, if you want to answer this too after Alexandra, that'd be great. There is always such a risk. And basically we have never graduated the IMF program. There was none due to different reasons. And there is a, such a risk that we will not basically move forward with the reforms. And that's the signal that I was talking about is that this draft laws, which are submitted by the basically key party of the parliament, this is again what Hanna was talking about, uh, judicial reform, that it doesn't comply with the IMF. Uh, therefore, there is such a risk, especially taking into account that we have received this first tranche, we have received some money from the European Union, but still more to go. We are, are in the, basically, as far as I know today, we are on the market, international market with the European issue. And uh, therefore, we partially secured our financial stance. However, uh, without a continuation of the IMF, um, we will not receive the second tranche. We are not likely to receive uh, macroeconomic uh, financial uh, assistance from the European Union. And this is what we need for uh, basically going forward this year as well. Without this assistance, we will not uh, fulfill the budget. So basically, either our government is ready to reduce, to make another budget sequester, or um, it will just not uh, pay some money uh, to, I mean, like to, com to comply with the liabilities. However, the risk is there, but it is as usual. That's why I'm saying that I still hope that the government will take the ownership of reforms. So it will not say, oh, IMF has told us to do this or that. It will definitely just go with reforms and will uh, continue a good path of reforms. Probably I'm here even more optimistic than Hannah was at the end of her speech, but uh, I really hope for this because uh, the problem here is that it's not talking, we are not talking about only the second tranche this year. We need finance, uh, like concessional lending from IMF, European Union, and World Bank next year because debt payments next year in, in, the, in 2022 are still high. And therefore, without this concessional lending, we will not have also access to international capital market. Therefore, there will be a question what to do next. 
and uh, I will not think that the kind of some debt restructuring that some uh, MPs are suggesting is a good policy for Ukraine. It's dangerous policy because what we see from other countries uh, that have stepped on this dangerous path, they have inflation, they have national currency depreciation, the poverty is high rocking there, and that's what we don't want to uh, for basically our population in the country. And I think that this is clear already to the president, to uh, presidential administration, and therefore they will still have to go for reforms and they will self, still have to go with the IMF together. Uh, Jonathan, if just uh, may I sure. add briefly what Alexandra um, said. Um, uh, and today there is uh, also appeal to the president uh, signed by different economic think tanks uh, demanding to president, uh, for president to focus on key priorities in the economic sphere. But uh, we also have to remember that every day Ukrainians are watching pro-Kremlin Russian, almost Russian TV channels, which are saying that NATO is bad, that for Ukraine is better to be neutral. Second, that uh, let's not take money from IMF because this is really uh, very painful for future generations. Better to print money, emission of uh, Grivna, or to go for default. So can you imagine like there are debates and different MPs from servant of the people, op opposition bloc and others, they are advocating for the scenarios of default or losing support from IMF as the best option for the nation. So in this uh, situation, uh, the previous government uh, headed by Mr. Honcharuk, and they had some discussion within the ministries that uh, what if uh, conditionalities from IMF will be too tough, so maybe uh, let's take a risk from default and others. So there are different people with no knowledge or experience and background. Plus, for Kremlin media, like one of the most popular TV channel, One Plus One, and thanks to the electronic declarations recently, all MPs had to submit their declarations, uh, which is one of the achievements after the Dignity Revolution that uh, everybody has to be accountable, I mean politically exposed persons. And the society, uh, find out uh, that Medvedchuk is a co-owner of One Plus One TV channel. And now we understand why there are lots of fake anti-America, uh, anti-reform uh, news at these uh, particular uh, TV channels and many others. So I think it's also very important. Uh, and uh, within the government, they established an office of simple solutions, or Alexandra, maybe you help me, simple solution or, or simple decision, something like this. So this is another way of populism, when <clears throat> instead of explaining the society that uh, to solve uh, pandemic uh, problems, to solve Russian hybrid warfare issues, uh, to, uh, to keep focusing on national security, re uh, restoring our territorial integrity. And so, so it's a complex issues, and it's not easy just to print money and to pay each Ukrainians 3,000 grivnas and to say that this is our mechanism, how we will uh, respond to the global uh, crisis and, and uh, lack of uh, money. And uh, so I think it's, um, it's another reason this uh, negative effect of pro-Kremlin TV channels uh, on uh, people's um, thinking. Just to add here, uh, it's the problem in Ukraine is real uh, that some people um, promise fast results from some kind of reforms or uh, simple uh, questions, simple issues, solutions, but it's not there. And experience of many countries show that uh, simple um, simple solutions can cannot be taken when we need a comprehensive solution. And besides uh, reforms impact, takes time. For example, if we talk about healthcare reform, according to the um, study of World Bank, it requires at least five years for the population to see a result. 
uh, in Ukraine, the reform has started in April, the second phase of reform. And now we are discussing that it's not successful. I mean, like, it's not enough time to discuss this. And the bad thing for healthcare reform is that it, it is uh, basically coincided in time with the pandemic. So basically what we see from my point of view is that pandemic actually so that we really need the healthcare reform, not the opposite thing. And the healthcare reform, which is currently on the way, is the good one, because it is uh, about universal coverage, about single payer. That's what is discussed basically by many countries in the United States as well at the moment, that this is a proper system of healthcare, which is to be conducted in order to be good in the pandemic time and in good times as well. Thank, thank you for, you know, for both of those responses to you. And I, I would just say just so the uh, United States is a good test case of why simple steps to address uh, uh, challenging issues like the coronavirus, the economic impact uh, don't work. We're experiencing in a number of our states in the U.S. a, a significant rise again in COVID-19. Um, and so we've really, and I expect that, that Ukraine is also going to share in some of these challenges. And I think it, it, this would go directly to uh, one of our first questions and I wanna just, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, read it to you. It comes from Pat Cox, who is former, uh, former member of the EU parliament. Um, he, he, his question is um, that, he, that he had worked on um, selective just, justice issues uh, during the Yanukovych days. Um, and he says, I deeply regret the creeping sense of deja vu now emerging. If it continues, it will damage Ukraine's external image and internal prospects. Um, he said it, it appears that sort of the, the, this mentality, Soviet mentality appears to be making a comeback. Can our Ukrainian colleagues comment on why this post-Maidan revisionism is happening? Why now and what or who is behind it in their view? And, and he thanked us for organizing this event. So um, Hannah, I'm, I'm hoping maybe I can start with you because you, you touched on um, some of the actors. Um, you touched on sort of television uh, stations. You've talked about even Servant of the People Party seeming to pick up on what would be uh, pro-Moscow, pro-Kremlin, um, both uh, talking points and propaganda. Um, this is something where you have a convergence of, of oligarchs and these forces as well. And I'm just, I, let me just sort of, if you can answer uh, Mr. Cox's question, and I think it's a good one, and especially coming from somebody who's been so deeply involved and concerned and supportive of Ukraine's um, democracy and euro Atlantic track. So if I could just turn it over to you, Hannah. Um, thank you, Pat, for your uh, important questions, and also thank you for your efforts to help uh, Ukraine with transformation. So, uh, of course, uh, it's um, not easy to answer in uh, uh, just one, two minutes, but uh, the, compared to others uh, like Poland or Baltic states, the influence of Russian on economy, energy, politics were more uh, high and more tough. This is why the fifth column or pro-Russian forces with their assets money, resources uh, here in Ukraine, they have big influence. And we, uh, I participated in uh, Orange Revolution. Uh, I used to be 22 years old and truly believe that Yushchenko will build the country I dream about. Then in 10, almost 10 years period of time, I, uh, I was in Kyiv among the co-organizers with uh, Svetlana Zalishuk and many others of uh, Yivro Maidan uh, and others. So it seems like uh, for new generations of people who, uh, um, who received a chance to uh, enter to the politics, to parliament, to government, unfortunately we were not the majority to make a true changes and make the changes irreversible. Still, there are lots of uh, old political elites in Ukraine with one leader for decades and with political projects, because it's even hard to say that in Ukraine we have truly democratic political parties. So we adopted a law on state financing of political parties. So before local elections and also for next 
electoral season, uh, presidential and parliamentary elections, it's now very important to keep focusing on investing efforts and time in building political parties in the reality of post-truth, digitalization, and uh, modern societies when uh, strong uh, old, uh, like not uh, uh, strong politicians are not uh, popular in Ukraine. And also to cover TikTok audience, young generations. Also free and fair media. Look, uh, we adopted a law on public broadcasting in Ukraine in 2016, as I remember. But still, Ukrainian public broadcasting, Suspilne and others, they cannot compete with oligarchic TV channels. They don't have enough resources, enough uh, uh, professional people to compete. So this is why mostly people are watching TV. But the positive news is that the usage of uh, social networks, Facebook and others, are growing. So for young uh, political, political parties, this could be a chance. Also, there is a huge gap between the poorest and the richest in Ukraine. There is no um, actually middle class, self-made people. Uh, the middle class, this is the people who were the most active uh, participate, uh, participants of uh, two revolutions. But it's not enough during the elections to make a, a responsible choice. This is why the populism, because of lack of middle class is growing in Ukraine. And it's hard for serious politicians to compete with the populist. Uh, for example, I cannot promise people to decrease tariffs for gas or to put everybody in jail immediately because this is unrealistic and I will never do this. And it means that I will uh, uh, be defeated by the populists who are promising this and won elections. So this is another issue. And of course, uh, oligarchs. Oligarchs, they are, um, uh, in 2015, uh, Ukrainska Pravda, Ukrainian Pravda, published an article why the next president of Ukraine will be Zelensky. The article with such title was published by expert Serhii Boberenko in 2015. Serhii Boberenko analyzed uh, the trends uh, between different political players and uh, their movie, uh, Servant of the People, Suhana Roda, Servant of the People. And he predicted in 2015 that with such movie, Kalamoyski, who supported um, this movie on his One Plus One TV channel, Delensky will become a president. So now my question is, and I know that some oligarchs now investing in recognizability and making popular several candidates. So they are preparing for presidential election after Zelensky and others. So the question is to Ukrainian uh, civil uh, society, to uh, think tanks and uh, Ukrainian um, state, statesmen. What we are doing, not to allowing different people and especially pro-Russian forces to make influence on our choice. And uh, also another answer on pet questions is double standards. Unfortunately, after dignity revolution, some of reforms, especially judiciary, were adopted too late with no like um, comprehensive amendments. And now this is the consequences of some trade between different political uh, players. And I think it's really important to invest in experience uh, uh, um, state-oriented people and also to work with media if we want to uh, win next uh, presidential and parliamentary elections and not see different interference of oligarchs or pro-Russian forces. Alexandra, do you want to weigh in on this question? I'm just, I was just continuously thinking while Hannah was uh, talking that we really need investments in human capital. And what it means here is education and healthcare as well, and especially education. The knowledge of our population on their responsibility is really weak. We still have huge paternalistic moods in our society. We still have people who think that government can print money as such and just doesn't want to. 
the population still thinks that uh, many things could be done very, in a very simple way and doesn't require um, time. And that's why uh, many people think that quick promises will provide quick results. And that's a kind of a problem. And therefore, we really need a kind of education reform and starting from schools and universities talking with, with the children as well, I mean, like our future generation already, how economy work, works. So they will not buy these populistic um, promises that we have at the moment. And this is kind of a bad situation at the moment, just because we require time even for this kind of education. And uh, hopefully we will still uh, push forward the reforms and we will be on the way of these reforms. Uh, and I think that the best reform which basically happened during the last five years, and Hannah was talking about this today, is decentralization. Because we really have big success in, the, in those areas mm -hmm. where we have smart people in local governments. And in the, uh, the Institute for Economic Research and Policy Consulting uh, last year has published a good book on the successful reforms in local levels, uh, different ones. And one of the biggest success was this realization. Basically, people have already received the chance to see that smart people are at some places and can basically provide reforms. And the, Basically, these smart people are elected by those people who live in the area. Therefore, our election really um, defines our future at the moment. And therefore, that's what kind of this knowledge which should be brought by civil society. And this what I think that civil society can do at the moment, this kind of awareness of this. One of the, uh, one of the questions, um, just on that last point, <clears throat> on civil society is, uh, one that we got was about how to get civil society more involved. It seems that uh, that that civil society's role is uh, has been stunted, and so how to get more how to get civil society more engaged in government and government more engaged um, with civil society. Um, I don't know if that's that that certainly is a question, um, and I'm not sure if that really is an answerable question, but I want to sort of pocket that one question, maybe come back, Hannah, too, because you mentioned your role. Um, and I recall back, I mean, Ukraine has had a robust civil society uh, for many years, but post-Maidan uh, was sort of this explosion of, of, uh, of civil society organizations um, playing a real leadership role. It almost, I mean, if you if you were looking globally at, at a space where civil society was strongest, you'd have to point to, to Ukraine. And that still is there, but I'm I'm wondering if the state of civil society has been weakened um, by the government, the current situation, or fatigue, um, uh, and and so also disappointment about the lack of prosecution on attacks on civil society, um, and then maybe the the sort of reemergence of the forces like oligarchs or Medvedchuk and pro-Russian forces. So maybe. May I, I'll pose this to you, maybe Hannah, just to, to pick this up. One of the questions we received was asking about how do you sort of infuse new uh, energy and cooperation, if that's even possible. And I wanted to maybe get your assessment quickly on, on civil society. I think it's really important for Ukrainian civil society to bring um, more new people, especially from um, different uh, educational institutions, universities. And uh, during my work in the parliament, uh, more than 200 students studied at the Committee of Foreign Affairs. So this was my investment and uh, into the young generations, 200 students from different regions of Ukraine. So uh, from one week to several months, uh, having internships or uh, study visits in, in Kyiv at Verkhovna Rada. One, for example, one of my stu stu former students, now she is uh, working as an assistant to one uh, member of European Parliament, uh, Katerina. So I think it's really important to provide these uh, chances, this opportunity for young generations to see how the bureaucracy, how the state apparatus works, how a decision are makes and others. So this is first the practical side 
of uh, students to be more uh, prepared for uh, responsibility if one day they decide uh, to run for local elections or to, par uh, to parliament. And uh, I agree with Alexandra regarding the education because uh, we need uh, also uh, uh, a little bit adapt our education system to the reality of a new world with hybrations, with using media and uh, fake news and others, media literacy to be more prepared of young generation, hundred, hundred generations for taking responsibility of building state. And also decentralization reform, it's one of the anti-corruption reform, which also helped to find new political elites from scratch, from grassroots. And one day these people will be uh, serving the country as a member of uh, members of parliament. But I think it's really important to focus in on a regional uh, um, civil society and building these bridges between them. And through different coalitions with key focus now, which is really important for, uh, to form the agenda, the to set up the priorities, also to keep focusing on implementation of reforms, uh, professionally helping Ukrainian government uh, with the expertise uh, in different fields, economy, uh, taxations and others, healthcare, and um, uh, also not to allow uh, or to demask, demask pro-Russian civil society organizations because Moscow is also using the third sector NGOs to promote their agenda in Ukraine and also discrediting uh, civil society uh, movement uh, uh, in, in Ukraine. Alexander, um, and just adding on to what Hannah said too about civil society, obviously your, your focus, your economic focus too includes both think tanks, but also uh, academic uh, roles, but also the private sector, which I think, and, and one, of the, one of the criticisms I heard several years ago was that private sector wasn't fully uh, as engaged or as involved uh, as they could be or should be um, in, in carrying out reforms. Are you seeing a change or is private sector still sidelined uh, in favor, and I'm talking also small and medium-sized businesses in favor of those that have political and economic connections, sort of the old, old guard? Uh, yeah, basically the business uh, has finally understood the that they have to play a role. So basically, a business, especially Ukrainian one, because ACC and EBA were always active. Currently, Ukrainian business is, a, um, I mean, like uh, organized in some associations, and they are becoming more and more active. Even though uh, sometimes uh, what I see is that uh, they feel it also that they are more pro-privileged type of business, and sometimes they ask for privileges more than, for example, for judicial reform. So basically that's a problem that I see in our business associations at the moment that they, for example, talk more about, uh, I mean like openly and uh, on the, some debates, they talk more about some like, like tax reforms, et cetera, even though behind the scene, they will talk about that they need uh, good uh, courts, they need uh, project property rights protection, et cetera. But you will not really see that they will tell, tell it, I mean, like put it openly in some uh, open speeches in their address to the government, to the president, even though this is what is needed. Somehow it appears that judicial reform, anti corruption measures are pushed forward by NGOs and basically civil society organizations, not by business associations. And that's what basically. Uh, is uh, strange for me because I think that business has to be a core on these reforms at the first place because none of the privileges, none of changes in tax system will not provide them with the good investment business environment if they don't have good courts and if they cannot uh, basically protect their property rights. And uh, about academia, then the universities and institutes are still really weak in pushing forward the reforms. And I think that here we will need more cooperation with this between uh, basically NGOs, academia, etc. There are some already pro projects like this, but they are still weak and uh, that's what we need. 
But also I would like to mention from what Hannah said that Russia basically is active in financing some kind of pro-Russian NGOs. And this is a problem that currently we face in Ukraine as well, that Ukrainians are not ready to uh, support civil society. Therefore, Russia is a good financing party. Therefore, we really hope for, again, I mean, like for European Union, for USA, for other parties, that they will continue financing uh, civil society at the moment until our population is um, kind of professional enough and uh, aware enough that there is a need for strong civil society, strong NGOs, and we'll finance these NGOs. Thank you. And, and, and on that latter point, I, I want to say that, you know, German Marshall Fund through, through the Black Sea Trust works closely with Ukrainian civil society. And I get a sense both from the EU and the U.S. that there will be strong support uh, for continued support for civil society, uh, whether we're looking at targeting youth. There's obviously a COVID-19 related component of, of support for transparency and accountability. Um, I think that's, that's certainly there. Um, and, and needs to continue. And I will say that the Friends of Ukraine Networks, uh, when we come out with our next uh, set of recommendations on, uh, for democracy and civil society, one of our uh, key points is to keep funding. So I think there's a lot, keep funding civil society, keep funding, working, making those connections, uh, working with Ukrainian partners to lift up and, and strengthen the connection also between government and civil society which I think is not easy to do. Uh, but when we, when we talk about this particular question of support, external support, internal support, um, one of our questions that we had and um, uh, comes really to this question of sort of Western uh, support. And uh, Adrian uh, uh, Carberson, who's one of our uh, vice chairs and one of our leaders for our Friends of Ukraine Network asked uh, to Hannah and others, what and this really goes to the question of sort of U.S. engagement and I think EU engagement, um, European engagement is what might be some pathways for the West to better engage with Zelensky and his team, in pursuing reforms and strengthening a reform coalition in the Parliament. Is there a danger that Western criticisms, without better engagement, may just push, uh, may just push them more towards reliance on oligarchs and Medvedchuk forces? So I think it's a really um, good question is that, and, and I will ask you too, Hannah, you've worked with, um, you know, both of you have too, with um, Western partners during uh, Obama administration, Trump administration. Um, I'd be very upfront, I think there's a very different approach to, uh, to engagement at higher levels. You had a, a Vice President Biden, I mean, it's also been part of uh, some of these challenging issues between the United States and Ukraine that we, that we won't get into. But maybe you could go to, to Adrian's question, which is this balance. Um, and by the way, this may all get changed dramatically uh, when the U.S. has its own election. Um, if uh, Mr. Biden is elected as president, you'll have, certainly could have somebody who has deep, intimate knowledge in a way most others wouldn't about the reform progress and process in Ukraine. I don't think any, any vice president in U.S. history has spent more time working on anti-corruption reforms in support of in, in a space like Ukraine. So, um, and I think this would also go where I'm looking at Bruno as well, which is the leadership. There's a new leadership in the commission. There's a new enlargement commissioner um, and others. And maybe, uh, Bruno, I may actually just pull you in on, sorry to do this to you, just to get your thoughts quickly on how you view this new commission looking at this type of engagement. It's a new enlargement commissioner who's Hungarian, um, and uh, which is also a very thorny issue. So Hannah, maybe over to you to a try to address Adrian's question of, of this, how should the US engage? And now with this increased disinformation as well, anti-IMF, anti-Western, and, and concerns about Zelensky's path, how does, how does the West, how should we be navigating um, this engagement with Zelensky in a way that's most helpful? I think uh, we are G7. For example, uh, Germany provided an expert, uh, Milbrand, uh, on decentralization. 
uh, who is like monitoring, uh, advising and working with MPs and others. So I think it's really important uh, uh, to show more engagement from the West by uh, showing real uh, support, professional uh, expertise, also technical assistance. And now due to the COVID-19, of course, it's hard to organize all these visits. But I think it's really important to show the political will that the West understands and uh, how to say the painful way of transformation of Ukraine. And for example, uh, if um, uh, Chancellor Merkel and Macron, they had conversation with Mr. Putin, why not to organize the same conversation uh, with uh, Zelensky? Zelensky, M Merkel and Macron discussing a situation in uh, Eastern Ukraine, a situation with Crimea. You've seen a lot of demands from Russia to uh to, to send water from ukraine to occupy crimea and others so uh there is no ceasefire so i think it's really uh, also important uh to help to support zelensky with real fight with ukrainian oligarchs uh for example extradition of mr firtash there is no real um case in, in the situation then mr kolomoisky and uh another oligarch so it seems like the west has real leverages uh, how to uh, help Ukraine to conduct de-oligarchization, not to have this double uh, approach when Medvedchuk is uh, becoming richer and richer and buying royal yacht for 200 millions of euros in the European Union and he is not under the European sanctions and others. And also, um, uh, I think uh, it's really important uh, by providing financial assistance also to uh, keep focusing on uh, providing this uh, cheaper money to Ukrainian uh, business uh, when they have their capacity to develop their business, to hire uh, people uh, in Ukraine. Because without middle class, the influence of oligarchs and pro-Russian forces will be uh, very um, deteriorating and very negatively received in Ukraine. So it seems like, uh, compared to Poroshenko, it seems like Zelensky is not so afraid or not afraid, is not so, like, he's reluctant to hear. So the more you criticize, the less he's ready uh, constructively work with the West. But still, there are some red lines which is really important to explain Zelensky and his team, especially with political perse persecutions of uh, activists of Maidan and others. So it's inappropriate. It's uh, nobody will tolerate these politically motivated persecutions because this is also the image of Ukraine. Nobody will invest money if we see uh, these um, different cases and or attacks on Mr. Sternenko. Uh, or uh, Tetyana Chernovol or Volodymyr Getrovich and many others. So, uh, and also it's really important to show because um, what will be the price for Mr. Putin for his amendment to the constitution and his military trainings, caucus 2020. So it seems like the West is lacking of strategy towards Russia. And this is something like we are seeing here how some European nations trying to uh, use these double approaches to demand more from Ukraine, but less from Russia and not seeing some progress. So it seems like this uh, it's uh, really important uh, to show engagement, to show your experts helping uh, here. <coughs> But, and also fight with oligarchs and media. And I hope that Zelensky will realize that Kremlin media uh, watching, uh, working in Ukraine is against him personally and against Ukraine. And this will be like his inst inst instinct, instinct uh, to survive and not to allow to destroy his reputation and country's uh, uh, opportunity to move forward. Yeah, thank you. And I think that I just want to make one comment on, on sort of Western reaction to the constitutional changes uh, in Russia. I think they have been um, 
uh, missing. Um, there's a lack of focus and attention, agree with you. Um, and there's been relatively no reaction to what has taken place uh, in Moscow. And it's quite disappointing to see, frankly, on the U.S. side, is, uh, to see very little reaction to this, this type of uh, uh, complete takeover and coronation. Uh, Bruno, can I just turn it to you? Um, I wanted to, you know, obviously, in, in a sense, see the EU track is so important for Ukraine. Um, and everything we're hearing today suggests that, that that path, while, you know, when you look at polling numbers, you still see strong Ukrainian support uh, for that path. Uh, the actions aren't meeting the needs, aren't, aren't meeting sort of the 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 wants from the EU at this point to move that forward. It's complicated. And the EU is complicated right now as well with new leadership. Uh, I asked initially about how you think the new uh, new commission, it's not as new as it once was, but it's still relatively new, um, is is approaching these issues of, of Ukraine, but enlargement. And, and also, if you feel like you're bringing the right type of leadership, I think I can, and I'm happy to bring Oris in too to, to get his thoughts on the U.S. side in a second, but can I just turn it over to you uh, to get a reaction on, on the EU and Brussels component? And, and also, you've pointed out in our conversations about some steps forward on NATO in the, in the midst of all this, some, some positive news. So it's interesting, some steps forward, steps back, it's a little bit confusing. Well, Jonathan, you know, it's complicated. It's the official Facebook status of the European Union. You know that, right? Uh, but, you know, all jokes aside, look, the van der Leyen Commission came in with, with big ambitions. Uh, it was a commission of uh, Europe and the world, Green Deal, but obviously all this has been a little bit hijacked now by the Corona crisis. Uh, Europe is facing most likely a recession of its own, and rather than being a EU commission of Europe and the world, it's now at risk of being a new commission of COVID. Now, having said that, um, you know, we see that despite a new commission, despite a new leader of the EU Council, the uh, policy has not changed compared with the previous commission. I mean, th there is a continuation of policy, uh, von der Leyen, but also people like Joseph Borrell, the new high representative, have clearly expressed strong support uh, for Ukraine. So at the level of the European Union, I'm not so concerned, um, you know, regarding the support of, of, for Ukraine, even with a Hungarian commissioner in charge of the neighborhoods. Uh, I am more concerned about the capitals. I mean, Anna mentioned it uh, briefly. We, we see that capitals are divided uh, over what kind of relationship they want with Russia. Uh, some are strongly you know, against uh, rapprochement. Others feel that a warming up is actually pretty, uh, you know, pretty needed today. And you know, this division, in the end, it, it's Ukraine that suffers from it. it it's clear. Uh, so that, of course, is something that is that is present, uh, and, and it's something that is not truly being addressed uh, right now. So, but look, in the end, there's also that much the European Union can do. Uh, you know, you can bring the horse to the water, but you cannot make it drink. And in the end, it's only Ukrainians that can help Ukraine. Um, look, some would argue that the European Union could do more, but what is more? Um, you know, there's actually already a lot being done, I, I believe, here from Brussels, and you know that does. If you also take the, the the support offered by individual capitals, um, and I think you know, if you would say, well, the EU should do more, I don't even think that is feasible given the political attitudes uh, inside Europe right now. So this is just something to 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 keep in mind. Just one final point: I, I very much liked the points uh, on private business. I think this is very important because private business means jobs and jobs means prosperity. And, and that is very important. Now, I think perhaps if we talk about doing more, that is something that the EU could perhaps uh, focus on. I think the issue here is really that, um, well, if you first talk about oligarchs, oligarchs really don't see the benefits of integrating their businesses in line with EU values. Uh, for many, Europe is simply a place where you go party in London or you park your yacht in Saint-Tropez. Uh, but also when we talk about bigger companies in Ukraine or SMEs, we, we often see that they are very Ukraine-centric. And it's very rare that a Ukrainian company branches out 
internationally or abroad. And perhaps there, you know, the EU could come up with better policies to grant better access for Ukrainian businesses to also invest in Europe. Because we're often talking about international companies needing to invest in Ukraine, but the other way around is true as well. Ukrainian businesses need to be, be given opportunities to do business abroad as well. So this is something perhaps where, where the EU could help and really transform this mindset of, of short-term profits to, to, to long-term prosperity. I think this is also a very important mental click that we need to help building in, in Ukraine. We, and the way to do that, I believe, is to create that counterweight to the oligarchy. We need to create uh, you know, this middle class, uh, support entrepreneurship, SMEs, and this is something that the EU can do. It has expertise in these things. Uh, so that's something in my aspect where, where you know, I would recommend to focus on. Bruno, Bruno, thank you. Thank you for that, uh, that overview. And, then, and I agree with you on that last point. And I think that there's a number of partners that can be better more engaged um, on the economic growth side uh, to support Ukrainians and Ukrainian businesses. And I've seen that um, in a number of surrounding uh, countries as well and through some, some of the programmatic work both the EU and the US can, are doing and can do more of. Um, I'm gonna just, one thing, we're, we're getting close to the end, uh, but I wanted to just have Oris just quickly comment on the, on the US side and uh, because I think it's really important um, and Oris always has a good eye for um, sort of how, you know, what, what's taking place in, in the US perspective. And then I'm gonna turn it back to Alexandra for final thoughts and then, uh, and then to Hanna as well for final thoughts. Oris, just quickly over to you. Sure, thank you very much. Thanks both uh, Hannah and Alexandra for your truly comprehensive, informative, thoughtful and thought provoking uh, remarks. Uh, one could spend an entire session talking about US policy and US engagement. I'll just say this, I, I think despite some of the challenges, including with our president, it's going as well as could be expected. We could tell, we'll see what happens in November where I think our policy towards Ukraine, if things go the way some of us hope they will, will become more robust. But I think we need to continue and even intensify our diplomatic support and political support. That's always important. Rhetorical support too, these things matter. Obviously sanctions, we're doing fine, but I think we should strengthen our sanctions, including and to Hannah's point, even though, you know, people like Kolomoisky and, and um, Medvedchuk, there are some sanctions on them, but they could be increased, including the use of the Magnitsky Act, for instance. Uh, so there's room for improvement there. While I think we're giving uh, pretty decent support, both military and non-military, there's definitely room for improvement. Jonathan mentioned our Democracy Civil Society FOUN task force recommendations. They'll be coming out in a few days in terms of how we could enhance our support and assistance. Um, so, you know, we are, we are doing stuff, we are engaged, but there's definitely, I agree with all of you, room for improvement. We, we could be stronger supporters of Ukraine, but that also means doing what I did at the beginning and we did is sometimes, you know, telling the Ukrainian government some unpleasant truths and, and talking about things that could get in the way of stronger relations. So I'll leave it at that, thanks. Thank you, Urs. And I think that, that issue of direct messaging to Zelensky, <clears throat> I, think, I think that it has been unclear as to what the US and others, particularly on the US side, expect. And um, I don't think you're gonna get a clear message from President Trump when he's talking to uh, Ukrainian officials on issues such as reform or anti-corruption reform, I don't think you're going to get that. But you could, with the Biden administration, might be a, a very different, uh, a different set of messages if that happens in November. Um, Alexandra, can I just turn to you for final final thoughts? And thank you so much for for joining us. And I agree with everything that Ora said about this being thought provoking, um, and uh, you know about how we need to be thinking more. Uh, cohesively about approach to these challenges, both in the context of domestic, uh, a domestic approach in Ukraine, but also international partners. So your participation has been critical. Can I turn it over to you? Uh, yes, probably I will just repeat some things that I have 
uh, Saturday already, uh, is that uh, really, and basically what was said by other participants, that political financial uh, support by other partners is really valuable. And we have already received a lot in different spheres. Uh, however, we have to take also into account the capacities of our government. We cannot do everything at once. And this is a problem because during recent five years, uh, many issues were changed in many areas. And I think that if we had more concentrated and focused view, probably we would reach even more just because we have started so many and we couldn't finish all of it just because we didn't have a capacity. And that's where we also will need further support of European Union, US, US and other players just to give us this kind of, it's not really technical assistance even, but it's kind of a more assistance, both financial, technical, I don't know how to formulate it, uh, but to help us to grow in capacities. And this we, and I, I'm speaking about parliament, I'm speaking about government and uh, as well as civil society, because good people are not always professional people. And that's an issue uh, uh, because what Hannah said today, and this is really important that to teach, for example, young people, what is bureaucracy? because we cannot survive without bureaucracy, but there is a kind of certain level, which is kind of a good one, optimistic, uh, optimal one. And I would like to say also that we haven't talked today, but uh, when we talk about help to business in Ukraine, I would really thank, like to thank EBRD and the European Investment Bank, because they really support business in Ukraine and they support small business as well. And that's where I would like to have, I mean, like it's, uh, there is space for more investment project finance and there is more space for technical, technical assistance from this kind of sense. And uh, for Ukrainian side, we really need reform in education. We really need to reduce skills mismatch and we really need higher financial inclusion of people, higher economic background. And that's where basically I think still some assistance is needed to help us to create such programs and to develop academia in a stronger player in the, our environment. Absolutely, and I think that touches, connects to, to what Bruno was saying too about some of his suggestions and areas that would, be, that would strengthen uh, Ukraine and Ukrainians. Hannah, can I pull you in for your final thoughts? And thank you again, as always, uh, for um, uh, providing both insights and thoughts and direction, particularly for, for those of us sitting in Brussels and in Washington and those who are watching from from elsewhere. Uh, final thoughts on your end? Uh, thank you, Jonathan. Um, in 2014, I couldn't imagine that in 2018, Medvedchuk uh, will, start, will start suing me in Ukrainian court against my statement when I used to be the member of parliament. So, and now Medvedchuk is becoming more and more richer and influential person in Ukraine. So, but still, uh, I uh, now with uh, the group of uh, people, uh, former MPs and others, we have our NGO uh, and, and Advocacy National Interest uh, Network ANTS. So uh, we have the project advocacy, um, advocates of uh, um, civil society and uh, um, all uh, amalgamated communities. And I'm traveling uh, to Western Ukraine before quarantine and had several meetings recently. So I still uh, see the potential of uh, people uh, uh, who are very active and will protect Ukraine in different scenarios. But I think it's really important for our Western allies finally to make a decision that Ukraine and Georgia and Moldova, this is not countries between something or this is partner and others. One day, I truly believe that, especially after NATO recognized Ukraine as an enhanced opportunities partner, so uh, we will demand from Zelensky to reform state security service. He promised it one year ago. So, and we are insisting on this because this is one of the key reforms, state security service reform and others. So, and after North Macedonia, maybe Georgia 31, but Ukraine 32 member of NATO. So I think providing Ukraine with such perspective, or now when in the EU everybody is discussing about uh, Western Balkans and Albania and um, other um, Macedonia becoming uh, um, members of the EU, 
So I think this is the double standards. So uh, I'm sure that Ukraine and Ukrainians achieved a lot. So please, even if it's not like tomorrow, we will become a members, but provide us this perspective, which will help to mobilize political elite, civil society. It's like with visa-free regime. Uh, just uh, this uh, June, we celebrated three years of visa-free regime with the European Union, which opens a lot of opportunity, especially for young generations. So I think uh, you could be more geopolitically ambitious towards Ukraine, and this could become your strategy towards Russia. And especially in the ha second half of 2020, during German presidency at EU. For Merkel, it's really important to see some progress on uh, Eastern Ukraine, to see the ceasefire. So be serious with Putin. Okay, if there is no ceasefire, if there is no withdrawal of heavy artillery, if there is esca potential escalations risk are growing. So, okay, we are considering Ukraine the same like with Western countries <coughs> and others. And um, of course, there are different um, problems with the fifth colon uh, uh, in Ukraine, which are MPs working in some government uh, cabinets, but, but still the more ambitious we see from the West towards Ukraine, the less price we will pay in the future. Hannah, thank you on that point. And I think there's, uh, you know, I think there's many people would share that, that want to see that more uh, aggressive and clearer approach uh, to this type of integration. And uh, I think not looking back I think on both sides, both in Europe, the United States, but also on the Ukrainian side, and not seeing this change happen. Um, and I think, we, you know, in some ways, people feel like that path is that the train is a little bit off that track moving forward. And it has to be uh, a really uh, a greater vision of what that looks like, uh, both as an incentive for Ukrainians, but also for Western partners. And so I, I hope that by 2030, uh, we can all look back and and say that this path is really firmly there, just like it is for uh, Western Balkans. Uh, but there's a lot of work and that will require support and engagement on both sides uh, to make this happen. And so on that final note, thank you, Hannah, Alexandra, uh, Dennis, uh, and, and RPR, Bruno, Oris, John Alexander, my colleagues in Washington as well. Thank you for joining us for the Transatlantic Task Force. Uh, for this for this tenth tenth uh, uh, virtual event, um, and we look forward to having you join us again uh, the next time around. And just thank you to all of our participants and those that have joined uh, from uh, on both sides of the Atlantic and for joining us so early in the morning in in the U.S. Uh, thank you again, and 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 thank you again for for joining us. We look forward to seeing you again soon. Thank you.